They'll think of crime, they'll think of drugs, they'll think of all of the negative things, but East Knoxville is families who inhabit the neighborhoods. And these are fine, decent people. There was this idea to link this new Chilhowee Park to downtown with this street like none other in town. People would come, thousands, I mean tens of thousands. It's interesting that a Knoxville judge's decision is what desegregated Clinton High, but here at, at home, things were just kind of, kind of really gr gradual. There were, by my count, 107 black businesses that were destroyed by urban renewal. I get excited as I ride around because I know that the neighborhood has all the energy, all the potential. There are quality community, quality neighborhoods in East Knoxville that all of Knoxville can be proud of. Beyond the news headlines, how much do you know about East Knoxville? This area has a very complex history with many highs and lows, and it all started more than a century ago on this broad street, a gateway to downtown Knoxville. Magnolia itself was a sort of a grand street. And it had trees down the middle of it. Probably the broadest and straightest street in, in town. Still broad and blooming, Magnolia Avenue may not be as bustling, but offers hints of its prominent past. In the late 1880s, Knoxville doubled in population thanks to 40 factories and the railroad. And Magnolia Avenue, stretching 100 feet wide, paved a residential retreat from downtown. People began building some fairly high-end residences out here. Including the avenue's namesake, Magnolia Branner, one of the first to call the boulevard home. There was this idea to link uh, this new Chilhowee Park uh, to downtown with this, this uh, street like none other in town. The showpiece street marked by Magnolia trees welcomed visitors to Beeman Lake, originally a dairy farm turned venue, which became Chilhowee Park then pristine buildings. They were all white and built to look like marble from a distance. Range over the landscape, which offered swimming, dancing, and outdoor escapes. People would come, thousands, I mean tens of thousands. In 1910, Chilhowee Park became a national attraction thanks to the Appalachian exhibitions. One million people from around the country came to Chilhowee Park over a period of two months. Uh, to, to see this amazing exposition. The National Conservation Exhibition followed in 1913, which included a pavilion dedicated to African Americans. In the late 19th century, Knoxville was not very strict, as strictly segregated as it would be in the 20th century. So there were a, a few black people living here and there and, and doing business here and there. The Tennessee Valley Fair opened in 1916. Partly from people who, who missed the expositions. The fair was a major thing in this community every year. The bandstand is the only original structure left today. I can't think of an older building on, on Magnolia than, than the bandstand here. Businesses soon began popping up on Magnolia. Swan's Bakery is still, is still there. The building has changed some. The state-of-the-art factory opened in 1927. Moviegoers enjoyed Park Theater, a 600-seat cinema built in 1938. And Mountain Dew first fizzed at the original Hartman Beverage Building on Magnolia in the 1940s. Cause he's a bang in every bottle. But Chilhowee Park continued to be the main attraction. I started going there maybe when I was seven, eight years old. And during that period, black people were welcome to Chilhowee Park only one day a year. August 8th. In 1948, City Council began allowing black patrons to Chilhowee Park once again. We could only go to the park on Thursdays for the, for the skating rink. The Jacobs Building opened as a performance hall in the 1940s. This is where Knoxville discovered rock and roll. Chilhowee Park was indeed a mecca for uh, the big shows that came to town. The Jacob Building welcome. <clears throat> all the big name black artists as well as the others. From Duke Ellington to James Brown. And of course it was segregated. White people had to sit in the balcony when uh, the big black bands came and black people were on the main floor to dance. 
Even though City Council opened the park to all races in 1961, life on Magnolia remained segregated. We couldn't go to any restaurants anyway on Magnolia. I remember when the very first fast food company opened on Magnolia. I went there in 1960 or 61 and was told that we don't serve ketchup, pickles, or Negroes. Magnolia has witnessed society's highs and lows over the last century. As Knoxville expanded, businesses and even residents migrated, leaving Magnolia behind. Well, I watched Magnolia uh, come and go, express itself in various ways. But one thing hasn't changed. The Magnolias remain standing. You drive up and down Magnolia today and you see it's certainly more than 100 Magnolia trees. So people have kind of responded to the name with by planting trees. Austin East Magnet High School is less than two miles from Chilhowee Park. Coming up after the break, how two very different high schools formed one student body as we continue to look back at the history of East Knoxville. Austin East Magnet here off Martin Luther King Jr. Avenue is home to the Roadrunners. But in the 50s and 60s, the Mountaineers ruled this campus. Two very different student bodies became the school we know today. Austin East Magnet is one of the more diverse public high schools in Knoxville. However, that wasn't the case inside the school building 70 years ago. The schools really didn't desegregate until the late 60s. In the 50s and early 60s, Austin East was actually two separate segregated schools less than two miles apart. What is Vine Miller School now, that was Austin High School. Austin High dates back to 1879. A white female educator determined to offer black students quality education, fundraised for a high school, and convinced the Board of Education to contribute. That fall, she opened the first public high school for black students in Knoxville. And it was located at 327 South Central. And it was Austin High there from 1879 until 1916. The school moved several times from Payne Avenue to Vine Street, opening a new campus just a block away in the fall of 1952. Austin High was uh, a very good school. We had some very excellent teachers. And at that time, uh, because of segregation, you had uh, a lot of your teachers lived in the area. The year before, white students from Park City, Burlington, and other East Knoxville neighborhoods started classes at East High, the current site of Austin East, and became the Mountaineers. I started in 55, but um, it was about a five, 600 person school. Most of us were, were blue collar. You, I knew very few people who owned their own business. East and Austin were two of several new high schools the city school system and the Board of Education opened across Knoxville after World War II. I had no experience with any kind of integration the rest of my time in public school because they fought it. It's interesting that a Knoxville judge's decision is what desegregated Clinton High, but here at, at home things were just kind of kind of really gr gradual. That changed 12 years after the judge's ruling in Clinton. In 1968 they merged all black Austin with all white East or nearly all white East because they had begun to desegregate East High School in the middle 60s and eventually Austin East High School became virtually all black all over again. So they made an effort to correct that by offering the magnet program. That has been fairly successful. Today, Austin East is 83% African American, according to the State Department of Education, and one of the smallest high schools in the district with around 700 students. Urban renewal uprooted hundreds of minority homeowners and business owners in Knoxville. Coming up, two community leaders share how it forever changed their families and neighborhoods. In the 1930s and 40s, cities across the country began using federal dollars to build interstate highways, public housing, and remove blight through urban renewal. Knoxville used the funding to clear slums and substandard housing 
and to build James White Parkway. It impacted thousands of individuals and hurt some of the very people it was intended to help, especially minorities. What was dubbed progress changed the face of communities from Magnolia to downtown. I grew up down in the bottom. Former state representative Robert Booker and Knoxville's only black mayor, Daniel Brown. Whenever I come to this park, I'm back in my old backyard. Lived in two different neighborhoods in downtown. The bottom, named for its low-lying topography. The KUB building on Jackson Avenue sits on my front yard. And Morningside. I was born across the street. From what's now Dr. Walter Hardy Park. This was a working class neighborhood. Nothing fancy, just regular ordinary houses, uh, working class people. Until the early 60s, African American homes and businesses filled downtown's east side. First Creek flooded the bottom every year. The creek would rise either because of heavy rains or melting snows. And people who lived there just got used to the idea that they, gosh, I hear the water under the floorboards. And many of the houses in that area were substandard. So uh, we, we just had to rough it in the bottom. Many without electricity, plumbing, or running water. When urban renewal began in the late 50s, it brought welcomed improvements to the bottom. There were still people living in, literally in third world conditions. Uh, we knew that those structures needed to go. We knew that that creek needed to be corralled. And there were other things that required urban renewal. But unfortunately, urban renewal went too far. Especially as the city's nearly two decades of urban renewal projects spread east. There were positive developments like the Civic Coliseum, but they came at a great cost. There were, by my count, 107 black businesses that were destroyed by urban renewal. There was a total of 14 black churches that were destroyed by urban renewal. Nearly 3,000 structures demolished, including the African-American Carnegie Library, the Black Medical Arts Building, and the Gen Theater. But by the late 60s, you start seeing people saying, wait a second, we're tearing down way too much. Including Robert Booker, then a young lawmaker. Obviously, Denmark is not the only state in which there is something right. The church that I grew up in is torn down. The house that I grew up in is torn down. Uh, the house that I was born in, it's torn down. Like Mayor Brown, more than 2,500 families, 70% African-American, were uprooted from their neighborhoods through eminent domain. What they had was may have been fair market value, but it was not replacement value. You, you, they didn't have a place that they could move into. Many of these people who were living in, in private homes before urban renewal had to move to public housing. They built Austin homes and college homes for black people and they built Western Heights for white people. And, and products didn't have any stigma to them at the time. They were just places, they were new places that had, uh, you know, plumbing and electricity. And for many people, this was their first experience with that. And in, in so doing, they forced blacks further east, which meant that white people had to give up their property, which meant they had to give up their churches. So after 1963, East Knoxville basically became a black community. Mayor Brown's family moved to the Burlington neighborhood off Magnolia. Our house would be like right here. And for decades, the property at his family's demolished home sat empty. My problem was nothing has replaced it. All you have now is just a park. Park is nice, but you know, it doesn't make sense to tear down houses to build, to build a park. Once all of those businesses were scattered in, in different locations, they lost that cluster effect and lost the businesses. A lot of our landmarks, they don't exist because they, they're gone. And nobody thought about preserving a lot of things in the, that are historical to the black community. Urban renewal didn't just impact downtown. The University of Tennessee used it to expand campus into primarily white affluent areas and interstate construction damaged North Knoxville neighborhoods. 
Today, there's renewed interest in East Knoxville as developers push for a new baseball stadium in downtown. What's next for this area and the people who call it home after the break? East Knoxville is experiencing another transition. Many describe it as a neglected community that's starting to get attention because of its proximity to downtown, leaving neighbors wondering the future of East Knoxville. I get excited as I ride around because I know that the neighborhood has all the energy, all the potential to thrive. Leroy Thompson has been traveling these East Knoxville streets since he was a kid and wants you to see beyond the negative news headlines. There are quality investments, quality community, quality neighborhoods uh, in East Knoxville that all of Knoxville can be proud of. To him, opportunity is at every turn. As you can see, you have several out parcels that are primed uh, for restaurant, uh, for businesses. Thompson and others are determined to overcome the negative stigma that hangs over East Knoxville. They'll think of crime, they'll think of drugs, they'll think of all of the negative things, but East Knoxville is, uh, is, is not just that. But you have a lot of working class, solid families who inhabit the East Knoxville neighborhoods. And these are fine, decent people. We don't have a lack of yeah. vision and talent in the black community. The know? violence is not a um, black people problem. It's a poverty problem. Our issues are resources. Dr. Nkesha Alamin is the founder of The Bottom, a creative community building and cultural space. My vision is for, for black folks to feel at home, to feel safe, to be, feel seen, and to feel welcome at The Bottom. Named and located in the African-American neighborhood destroyed by urban renewal, they're in the process of moving. Like where do you see camera? Right here. Yeah. We saw uh, changes in our neighborhood that um, were happening quickly, um, that were drastic, uh, and so we thought it was best for us to own our space. Thanks to community fundraising, The Bottom has purchased this property off Magnolia. We're excited to be in the black neighborhood. We want to show self-determination right. is really one of the tactics that can can stop that cycle and the curse of urban renewal. However, they fear history is already repeating itself. And all of the changes that are happening, the streetscapes, all of those things are not, they're not of our community, they're not for our community. New businesses are starting to pop up on Magnolia, along with for sale signs. We need some good housing stock. When you lose home stock and you have rental, nothing wrong with rentals, but you don't have that tie to the community because you can up and go. Longtime community leader and former lawmaker Robert Booker believes a new baseball stadium would get Knoxville on base, especially with jobs. Every politician in the black community who runs for office says, we need jobs. And that's the only way to create jobs. The city doesn't create jobs. The county doesn't create jobs. But with our tax monies through the city and county, they can invest with private people and give us those jobs at that stadium. Thompson agrees if the East community benefits. And are we just going to transition that in and make it for the haves right in the very community where the have-nots were? Or are we going to look at opportunities to make investments in the families, in the residents, in the African-American businesses and neighborhoods so that historically it can be one of the pillars that perpetuates the change of economics and helps it for black and brown people in Knoxville, Tennessee. The community and developers continue to meet about a baseball stadium. A plan and final approval is expected by year's end. If you would like to see more in our East Knoxville series, visit WBIR.com or our YouTube page. Thanks so much for watching.